there's always something what you can do better. You will never achieve a satisfactory level. People do not like changes, even if we know the world is changing and we have to change, we have to adapt to new environments. It's not a fluffy subject. Say everybody wants to go lean until they realize what it takes. During my time in Toyota, I have moved my internal borders of what I think is possible. Our output today is 400 units a day. If you don't have the right level of quality, it will not be a stable process. Challenge what you should rather than what you can. We are just at the beginning in total. Yeah. gain more and more stack here and then we need to increase also capacity there. But My I name is Matthias Fischer, I'm president and CEO for Toyota Metro Handling Europe. When I was joining Toyota, I was a bit afraid because it's a, it's a big name, it's a giant company. And my expectation was that everything is written in stone and we have procedures and uh, like you have it in big companies normally. And what I found is uh, it's a culture in the company that is very, very similar to a small company. We have a lot of family values, you have connection to the top management without any problems. And so you, you really feel that you're working in a family-based company with family values as well, instead of a, a huge conglomerate. And that's lovely. What is success? Um, uh, first of all, you can measure in numbers. It's this one one way of measuring it. But in Europe, we would like to overachieve what we, what we have as a target. So this is how I measure success for, for myself. And then as well, um, how satisfied is the team? Do we have a good team? How do we have a good collaboration? I think this is even more important, I think, uh, than the numbers, because the numbers are just a result. But if you have a good team together, then the numbers will come, follow automatically. It started with a strategy to become number one in the European market and then our Japanese colleagues handed over this nice gift to me and say, okay, you have the target and the ambition to become number one in, in Europe. So let's color one eye and if you color that eye, this is the target setting. And when you achieve the target, then you can color the other eye. You can still see that Aruma has only one eye colored, so we are not number one in Europe so far. But when we achieve the number one position, then I will go there and color the other eye. The Daruma is watching you. So watching you every day what you're doing to achieve your target. We are number one already in the, in the, in the global market with a huge distance to our next uh, competitors. But in Europe we are number two position and we would like to achieve the number one position in Europe as well. When, when Japan is setting a target, it should be not achievable. It's just a direction. So if, if we are at 100 and say you should go to 150, and we say 150 is a joke, we cannot achieve that. So the normal behavior in Europe would mean we do not even start because we cannot achieve 150. And then our behavior normally is why should we go for it at all? Because we cannot achieve it. But for Japan it's important the direction. They say you need to go in that direction, it doesn't matter if you achieve 120 or 130. They do not expect that you achieve 150, but they would like to have the same, the, the, these high target to a set a direction. For us in Europe, it's then difficult to understand where is the satisfaction level in between, between 100 and 150. Are they satisfied with 105 or 120? So we have to translate that then into our, let's say, our local targets then. Well, the target setting, I will never adapt to the European culture because uh, this is something that we will never, never accept, let's say, in, in, in the European environment. So we need to translate that into, into our, our culture and our, our target settings. And we have a good agreement with Japan how we do that. We have a, Let's say a plan for the next year and then we have a given or challenging target in addition to that in Japan. So we're always running with these two numbers, the challenging target and the one where we said this is a European target. We are doing things differently compared to Japan as well. If you look at the uh, so-called Nimawashi process, Japan is extremely consensus driven. So Nimawashi process means before you make a decision, you all the stakeholders, you know, 
law have to agree to that. And then you go to the big meeting and saying, yes, this is what we do. So it has already been aligned before. In Europe, we have different cultures as well. I think Sweden is very close to the Japanese culture when you talk about consensus. If you go more to the southern part of, uh, of Europe, you have more the Latin countries. They are more, more working, in, working in the hierarchies, what you have, it's more top-down. The boss decides, and then everybody is following. When I worked in Italy as an MD, for example, I had to learn that as well, because when you make a decision there, you have to stick to your decision. Even if it's wrong, yeah, but you have to stick to your decision in a Latin country, because otherwise your people will lose, lose the respect. So you need to get the information in forehand to, to make the right decision because you have no chance to switch it around. If you look for a German culture, for example, Germany is different as well. In Germany you make a decision and then the discussion starts in the team normally. Was it decision right? Was it wrong? Should we adjust? Yeah. What a stupid decision. And then they change it yeah, to maybe a better way. So I think as well in Europe we have different decision-making processes in the cultures we are working in. Yeah. From, and it's going, you can say, from, from north, much more consensus driven to the south, much more thinking in hierarchies. When we have management team meeting, we have a closed room, and then we say, everything can be said. There are no written rules that you're not allowed to complain or something. If somebody has something against something, we should openly put it on the table. I don't like to have a team where everybody is saying what they see is or saying is right. relentless in pursuit of lean, it's quality first. You need to have stable process, you need to involve people, and then when you have the involvement, you need to have the organization, the management, and then trial and error. In this factory, when Toyota bought the company in year 2000, we produced around 25,000 units. And today, this year, we went about 80,000 units. So four times almost higher volume by double number of people working in the factory. The biggest change was to go from station-wise assembling to line thinking. Cycle time maybe three, four, five hours and then suddenly cut it up in uh, smaller pieces. The new system with line thinking is all workload in smaller pieces, so it's much easier to adapt and train. We focus a lot compared to other companies in Europe on our daily business. Find out all the muda, all the waste, so that we really can become number one. When you have uh, full control over your day, then it's much easier to understand also what's necessary for tomorrow. The morning meeting is to really take control over the day. There we report the status from the shift before so that we are 100% sure about how we are prepared for the next shift. To have a continuous flow in the production, that's our main target, not running faster, but always have the processes rolling. To have a stable process running smooth without any interruptions. That's the, the main target, the main vision in our production system. No process can always be perfect, it's never perfect. You will never achieve a satisfactory level because this is as well in, inside the culture. This is very, very deep in the DNA and as a culture. So if you, if you think you have a very good process, there's always something what you can do better. They're looking into seconds how they can uh, adjust, how they can produce it better every day. We should never be satisfied and we should never, never say we are living in a perfect world or we're living in a perfect company. It will never be perfect. Even if we are striving to be perfect, there's always room for improvement. We have been on the lean transformation journey ourselves now for quite some time. We have studied the TPS concept deeply together with our Japanese senseis. With the knowledge we now have, we decided to create uh, the Toyota Lean Academy being our lean advisory service to the market. Toyota production system is actually a quite technical system. It's a set of methods applied on a process to make it more efficient, less waste and so on. However, to implement that centers very much around the leadership and the culture which is for us in the Western world something that we need to address. What we have in the Swedish culture and perhaps also in the Western culture is the question why. Why should I do this? And what is the purpose of this? So we need to spend a lot of time to introduce the purpose and I think that's valid. You should always introduce why. 
Me and uh, actually my whole team decided to join the masterclass leading the Toyota way two years ago. I think the cultural and the leadership part of it was the most fascinating. To learn from Jeffrey Leiker who has made uh, interesting research on Toyota for many years. We found out, even ourselves being from Toyota, that he had a very interesting cultural outside-in aspect. We talked about the success rate of a lean project. In the beginning of a lean project there will be a lot of new energy, a lot of focus on the task. In the initial parts of a lean project you might find that everybody becomes quite emotional and, and want to join and, and so on. It is more when you come to the part where maybe the lean team goes away, then the voices might appear that would like to go back to the old ways of working because they might find some uh, examples of the new way which is not working perfectly which is natural because it takes time to change and the trick to make it is to really try to integrate the new ways of working into the process into the leadership routines so that you have something that can continuously ask for the waste and ask for the for the solutions to eliminate the waste I think uh, during my time in Toyota I have moved my internal borders of what I think is possible or impossible. We have a saying that challenge what you should rather than what you can. When we started to approach the 90% reduction of quality defects, we thought that was more of a vision rather than a target. Uh, but our Japanese sensei Nomura-san, he kept supporting us and pushing us towards this target. Looking back on the journey we did, we managed to go almost all the way we reached more than 80% reduction of the quality defects, which we in the beginning thought was impossible. But looking back, yes, it's possible. One of the main pillars is challenge, and that is really driving us forward. Everybody wants to go lean until they realize what it takes, because it's, it's not a fluffy subject. It's something that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and you always aim for more, and you never give up. the serum Buddha, so uh, Buddha is waste. We decided to put these words in because it makes customer curious about it, because they don't understand what is it. So you have a chance as well to discuss and have a conversation about it. And if you look at logistics flows today in retail business or in, uh, in the industry, there's a lot of waste in it. And what we would like to do with, with our strategy is making the, the customer's logistics leaner, so taking the waste out of the processes. The strategy is targeting to two directions. One is from, from the outside view with customers, but we can use it as well internally because our processes are, are as well not lean enough. And then we have a different business environment. Say we are in a so-called old economy economy you know, with, with forklift trucks what we have sold in the past but now we are moving into AVs and AGVs so automated guided vehicles everything is going into automation this is uh, very important for the future that we have all the data available the customers can learn from it and then they can improve their logistics with the data what we can offer. We are still producing products, but this is not the main content. The main content is really servicing them as well afterwards. We have more service technicians compared to what we have on uh, workers on the production side, for example. We have 3,500 service technicians, it's a huge organization. We, we have to look into total life cycle costs as well, from when they're purchasing it, using it, scrapping it at the end, or giving it back to us, and we are refurbishing them, and, and it goes into the second life cycle. If you look at the automation journey, what we have in front of us and where we are today, I think we, we are just at the beginning in total. Yeah? But not only we, I think the, the whole, whole industry, if you look at Industry 4.0, there will be a lot of changes coming in the future and, and uh, automation is just at the beginning. If you look into what we are planning for the future when we have a deep learning into the machines and into the trucks and, and they're talking to each other, we are not there so far. The self-learning, the AI is not in. This is what we're working on. This will take some time. You need to have the right algorithms for that as well. Um, but I think we will see big changes in the next five years. I'm standing just be in front of the uh, BT Wall of Fame. We have not only executives here like uh, Ted Toyota or Sakichi Toyota, our founder. You can find employees on this as well, like over there. And Carlson, she has worked for 50 years in the company. You even can find a very famous actor over there, like uh, Sean Connery, 
It was product placement made in 64, the company has even paid for it. So it's a, it's a nice, nice way of as well explaining our culture a bit, that everybody is important in our company, not only the uh, executives, but everybody is important. In, in the next two years, we would like to execute our strategy. That's the most important thing, that we're following our high priority programs, what we have, that we invest into uh, the automation business moving forward there. For sure, we'd like to become as well number one. We would like to grow further. But the, the focus point is really execution of the strategy. Sometimes I think um, we can be faster. So if I regret about something, is we are sometimes a bit too slow. We need to be faster. We need to accelerate. This is something where I really say this is what, where we can be better. I think that the pressure of what we have most probably, or what we have personally, is you, you would like to do everything right. And uh, this is something what you normally cannot do. You, you would, as, a, as well as the CFU, you make mistakes from time to time. And, uh, you have to live with that. And another challenge most probably is the, the size of the organization is growing, it's growing, it's getting bigger and bigger. And um, you would like to have everything under control, what is difficult. So you need to have as well a lot of trust to your team, to your organization, because you cannot control everything and you cannot manage everything by yourself. What motivates me, I think the um, most important thing for me is the, the team what I have around me. When I've talked with people here that they're satisfied, that they're moving forward, that you have an environment where People can feel we are successful, moving in the right direction. They have a working place where they say, I love to work, work in here and enjoying the success together. I think this is the biggest motivation. It's not coming from your bosses, it's not coming from the salary, it's more coming from really from, from the team, what you have around you, uh, and that you have success together. When I was 25 years old, I just started, uh, um, let's say, in my career as a, as, a, as a very young trainee after university. And I, I would say, don't make a career plan. Do your work, do it as good as you can, uh, move forward, and the rest will follow automatically. In a couple of years, when I go into retirement, and I ask the people then five years later, if they still, uh, still know me, still remember me, uh, and talking good about me as a person, I think that would be a good, that would be a good achievement. Not about the achievement of the numbers, but as a person that they say, hey, it was a good boss that we had, moving in the right direction, was good to interact with them. That, that would be nice.